I was born and raised in church like many of you. I was not a PK, preacher's kid, like my daughters, but I was pretty much a church insider from day one. I knew all the tricks and all the ways to get ahead. At least I thought so. So I knew, uh, for instance, where in those days they, they prepared the communion trays. We used to have trays that we passed the elements around with in ancient times, as you remember. I knew where they prepared them and where they put them when they were done with them. And so if we wanted a forbidden little snack while mom and dad were talking forever in the foyer after worship, we would run to that back room and chow down. And you might hear that and say, uh, Mark. And I just replied that the Bible says, confess your sins to one another. And so fulfill the law of Christ. And, and there, there may or may not have been some swimming in the big old church baptistry though I'm not confirming that because I'm not sure that the statute of limitations has run out on that crime yet. But as an example of my insider's knowledge that came in handy, um, whenever we had a Bible class teacher that wanted us to do memory verses, and I think that's a great thing for Bible class teachers to do, uh, but whenever we had one uh, that allowed us to pick the first one that, that we would memorize. I always raised my hand extra high and very enthusiastically and volunteered that I would memorize John 11.35. <laughs> Some of you know and have that one memorized because it's the shortest <coughs> verse in Scripture, right? It says... Jesus wept. Well, wasn't that noble of me? Uh, noble is a Greek word, by the way, for phony. <laughs> but one time I got really bold, and, and I tried that in a class that my dad was teaching. And dad said, you know, son, that's a really great chapter of God's word. You're just going to memorize the entire chapter. There's 57 verses in John 11. And so ended another one of my schemes down in flames. But, you know, John 11.35 is an important verse, even if it is the shortest verse in the Bible. The fact that Jesus wept says something very important to us that's worth thinking about longer than it takes to memorize it. And that's not the only place in Scripture we're, we're told that Jesus shed tears, that he wept. In fact, in the passage that, that I want us to open to this morning uh, and that we're going to use to close out our series of lessons about Jesus on the move, it tells us the very same thing. Uh, in, in Luke chapter 9, as you remember, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And now in chapter 19, where we'll conclude this, he has arrived on the outskirts of the city. Just having crested the, the hill that sits across the valley from the city, um, which we know as the Mount of Olives, he looks down upon Jerusalem from that vantage point. And here's what the text says, Luke 19 Verse 41 and 42. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Now Luke's the only gospel writer that, that paints this particular scene of Jesus weeping over the city. We didn't read the, in, the entire par paragraph there, but the Lord goes on and he describes 
in pretty accurate detail what's going to happen to the city one day. About four decades in the future from the time he spoke these words, what's going to happen to Jerusalem, how the city is going to be surrounded by armies, it's going to be destroyed utterly, all because they refused to recognize who Jesus was. The very one who could have given them the peace and the security that, that they needed, that very person they rejected, they didn't even realize that God had visited them in human form. So time and again on this trip to Jerusalem, we've seen Jesus heal people. Um, more than once, he has healed blind people. And often he, he contrasts physical blindness with spiritual blindness. And he seems to point out that spiritual blindness is more serious. It's a much more serious issue with greater consequences, eternal consequences. And, and here Jerusalem has rejected the one who could save her. The very Prince of Peace. He says, would that you had known the things that make for peace. He speaks these words through tears. What do we learn from Jesus' tears on this occasion? Well, I want you to notice first that the tears are not for himself. Even though Jesus is just a matter of days from when he will be unjustly arrested, unjustly tried, and then he'll be abused and tortured and, and then crucified. He, he does not shed tears for his own abuse, for his own pain, but for theirs. Uh, that is, for the people of this city, the people of Jerusalem. And for something really that's not going to happen for four decades. Jesus is much more concerned with their coming pain and death than his own. That's pretty amazing. You know, he had decided months before to travel to Jerusalem and to give up his life. In fact, that had been the plan from eternity, that that was what was going to take place this was how he was going to seek and save the lost, which was his mission. He was going to give up his life as a ransom for many. And so his tears are not for the fact that he's going to have to go through that. His tears are for them and their blindness and their bad choice. But, but what is it that, that makes him weep? What makes Jesus shed tears? One thing is when people reject the salvation and the peace that he offers. That rejection hurts him. It hurts him for them. It breaks the heart of God when people say no to Jesus. Why would that be? Because he knows what that means. He knows what's coming, you see. If it's true that God so loved the world, then it would have to make him weep when people turn away from the Son that God sent to save them, and when they turn as a result into the wrath to come. You know, Jerusalem, as the example given here, was going to be torn down brick by brick, because they had rejected the things that make for peace. And, and people who refuse the salvation offered to them in Jesus Christ will face an eternity without God in a place prepared not for them, but for the devil and his angels. That's what calls forth the tears of the Lord. He knows what's coming. Another thing to note 
about the Lord's tears on this occasion is that sometimes when people rejoice, Jesus weeps. It sounds strange, but it's true. If you look at it, what has just preceded the verses that we read a few minutes ago and that we're emphasizing today, it's the scene where Jesus approaches Jerusalem. He's riding upon a colt. And his disciples and others are, are celebrating and rejoicing and praising God. They're, they're excited. They don't really understand what's about to happen, even though Jesus has told them again and again. They don't understand. They, it's gone over their head about what the upcoming week has in store. Jesus, of course, knows all too well what is to transpire. And so Jesus doesn't get carried away with the enthusiasm of the moment. He knows all too well that, that some of the very same people who are cheering his approach will call for his crucifixion. I think we ought to keep this in mind. You know, as we, uh, when we celebrate, when, and, and when we weep, uh, nothing wrong with rejoicing, nothing wrong with being excited about good things, of course. And notice, if you look back, uh, verse 40, Jesus defends those who were uh, rejoicing. Some had said, you know, make them be quiet. And, and he said, I tell you, if, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So he, he in, in verse 40, defends those who are rejoicing. But we ought to try as best we can to celebrate the things that God celebrates and weep at the things that break the heart of God. What makes God celebrate? When people say yes to his son. We often say that the angels in heaven celebrate, right? God celebrates when people say yes to Jesus. What brings forth his tears? The opposite. When people say no, it's really not complicated. It's pretty ironic that the very name of this city, Jerusalem, has the, the word peace embedded in it. Uh, the writer of Hebrews points out this truth in Hebrews 7 and verse 2. But the Salem part of Jerusalem uh, is the Hebrew word for peace. And so it's sad because the one thing that this city has never really been known for since the time of Jesus all the way until today is peace. Even if you didn't know anything about Jerusalem and scripture, all you have to do is watch the news to know it's never been a place of peace. Far from it. It's been quite the opposite. It could have been a city of peace. And it could be today. There is one way to make it happen. Just one way, and that's to welcome the Prince of Peace. To say yes to Jesus. Jesus weeps on this occasion because he knows They've made the wrong choice, and he knows what's to come. Now, I see people all the time struggling to find peace in their lives. Just troubled and heartsick and full of worry and turmoil and conflict and all kinds of things that only Jesus can really deal with. 
I see that all the time. And the Lord still looks on just like he did on this occasion 2,000 years ago. And, and he extends his offer to people. And he extends his offer to nations. And still, so often, we imagine he weeps because people say no to the very thing that makes for peace in their lives. Him. just ask you to hear me for a moment this morning. It's not so difficult. Accepting and obeying the Lord leads to great blessing and rejoicing. And rejecting Jesus leads to the exact opposite. Great Pain. It, it's always been true. He's the creator. He made us. We owe him our allegiance, our service. He, he deserves our trust. This is the great question of life. Have you given it? I want to close our thought today and, and, and really our series of lessons from Luke's gospel by reading from another place from a co-worker of Luke's, the Apostle Paul. Paul, of course, was inspired by the Holy Spirit and wrote much of the New Testament and he wrote some incredibly powerful words to the Ephesians. There was a church in Ephesus in the first century. And he wrote them a letter. And in chapter 2 of that letter, he's talking about one of the, the biggest, I guess we might describe it as non-peaceful relationships in the history of mankind. That between Jew and Gentile in the first century AD. How to get these two opposites together. These people did not mix. They did not get along. They didn't trust one another. They didn't like one another. But God in Christ managed to bring these two warring parties together into one body, the church of Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear a few of the words that Paul wrote about this, but I want you to hear them, if you need, in light of your own situation. Are you at peace? Are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with your family? Are you at peace with mankind? Are you just at peace with yourself? If, if not, hear the solution that's offered here and described by the great apostle. This is Ephesians 2 beginning in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. One of the greatest conflicts in the history of mankind, Jew and Gentile, solved 
by the cross of Jesus Christ. Well, I want you to imagine Jesus not standing looking over Jerusalem as here in Luke 19, but standing looking over your life this morning, observing your life. And let me ask you this, is he weeping or rejoicing? He is our peace. Have you given yourself to him? Do you need to obey his gospel this morning? Do you need to recommit yourself to him this morning? Do you need the prayers of people who love you? If any of those things are true, let us know while we stand, while we sing.